Okay, so I thought I would say some things about that Gerald Edelman video that I just enjoyed so much. I will put a link down to it below. And if you haven't seen that video, just you know, stop this one right now, watch it first, and then you know, pick this up, and we'll we'll see if it makes more sense. First off, it, it is hard for me to say how much I found that just to be an absolute delight. It was, it's rare to find a video that I just agree with so much and uh, literally I go wow this guy I I w would love to say yes there are so many things in here that I want to rally with and I want to first you know try to identify some of the things and then see if I can't as best I can try to clarify where I would say well hmm let, 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 I would want to question some of these uh, other issues or maybe haggle about some of the finer points here. I think some of the the main things that I really enjoyed about that video um, for, first was his stress on ambiguity and the role that ambiguity plays in language, how essential ambiguity is, and that it's not a deficit, but it's one of the properties that we need to reckon with. And the degree to which voice recognition is a kind of parlor trick, I think he's Again, I think he's dead on there. Uh, his discussion of the difference between first order consciousness and then what he was calling second order consciousness, I, I found that to be, again, very right-minded. And all of the stuff that he was suggesting about the origin of language being some way in music and in a kind of distributed sociality of between and among people, not something reducible to the brain. Again, the, the comments that he had about the brain, about each person's brain being unique and the, the importance of that. Yeah, I, I, I want to stress that as well. I think that's very right-minded. Some of the other things that he said, you know, his criticisms of the possibilities of like neural net download or the capacity for people to I guess eventually create artificial consciousness his strategy of, of responding to that was so similar to what Kittler's doing in optical media where basically saying look it's gonna be something else you know you're, you're not gonna create human consciousness human consciousness what you're gonna do is you're gonna create something else now will it be somehow self-aware a second order or a third order I, I we don't I mean I don't think anyone would know what that would mean but it would be it wouldn't be human consciousness in mechanical form I, I think people who want to be hardline materialists are going to be stuck with the fact that the kind of consciousness that we know and experience one that has the kinds of ambiguity and historicity and dynamic sociality as integral parts uh, those are not going to be replicated by the machine. I think, if anything, again, the machine's going to introduce a very different kind of consciousness should consciousness be created through mechanistic or mechanical uh, means technologies. Okay, so again, I think there's so much there. The, now, here's some, a couple of things where I want to get at the haggle. Um, and well, let's first, you know, when he says that language likely is was preceded by appreciation for music and musicality. Yeah, I would strongly recommend that people go check out Suzanne Langer's work, her book, Philosophy in a New Key. I mean, yeah, we she, she would say we are the descendants of a singing, dancing, pantomiming ape, and that the discursive forms, that is the kind of speech that we know as discursive with grammatical uh, characteristics, that is a late comer, but before that there were these kind of presentational forms where the sheer acoustical um, properties of the sound were appreciated aesthetically. You know, and, and, and she suggests, you can even find this in children, you know, at, at, during the babbling period, there seems to be a great amount of pleasure that the child takes just in playing with the rhythm and the sounds and appreciation of sound is part of what then blooms into articulate speech. Okay, so I, again, th th this this video is just so rich in the way he's, you know, the interviewer cuts to the chase and he's responding to them. I think some of the, the issues that I would say about 
okay, and again, I, they're not critical. They're more like I, I would love to, you know, he's not obviously going to see this or respond to it, but I think, you know, I would love to hear other what other people think about it. But it's first, you know, I think he rightfully says that dreamless sleep, deep dreamless sleep is how we're going to define loss of consciousness. To me, now this relates, and I'm going to come back to the dreamless sleep in a second, but it kind of relates to some of the haggle that he has later when this question of belief comes up. Now, at about the 42-minute mark, the, the interviewer kind of says, well, what do you believe? And we're sort of asking about religious belief, and he said, look, you know, I think when you're dead, you're dead. And he was playing some, you know, that, that's probably not what some people want to hear, but he doesn't see any evidence that there's anything, you know, other than you know, what would normally disappear with the biological cessation of the body. I mean, you know, consciousness is in some way a a process that emerges through the interaction of various, again, kinds of complex relation states, uh, electrical, you know, distributions in the brain. I mean, it's it's pretty wild what, what actually happens, how it comes out of this. But again, it's not just in the brain. See, I think this is part of the thing he haggles at throughout, but he seems to miss it at the end. See, he, he and again, I don't want to make it seem like I'm being critical of the guy. I, I mean, I, I really celebrate that video. It's, it's I mean, for me, it's, it's absolutely brilliant. But, okay, see, he, he admits that dreamless sleep is the loss of consciousness, okay? Then he talks about the difference between first order consciousness and second order consciousness. And he starts to talk about, yes, second order consciousness is this one that we have through the self-reflexivity of language and this kind of stuff. And then when he gets to this belief question, he says, yes, he, he acknowledges that when you're dead, you're dead. But then it's almost like he succumbs to a kind of individualism, a metaphysical individualism, when he says that each brain is unique and that he sort of attributes his own reluctance to badger people about the afterlife issue by calling it a placebo effect. And he says, hey, look, you know, if people want to have hope for the afterlife, well, then that's their interest and they can kind of do whatever they want to do. And if, you know, if it gives them hope and consolation, then, then so be it. Who, who is he to uh, disrupt that or, or really challenge that? Again, I'm, I'm sympathetic to that. I think there's a lot of wisdom there. I think there really is. Another part of me, though, thinks what this is what Burke would call a eulogistic glossing. Why give it some rosy glossing when there is a wider truth that could be harvested from all of the things that he laid out? So Okay, so first we go to the dreamless sleep. We are places and moments of earth that only momentarily arise out of dreamless sleep. And during periodic uh, moments, we are awake and we unfortunately come to identify with awake consciousness. And we say that's who we really are, not realizing that, again, it's a periodic accomplishment and that we are at root are a kind of earth that dreamlessly sleeps that can only have itself momentarily through bodies that, you know, again, it haunts itself as another in some way. And it's, it's as if he's not seeing or not, not fully chasing out the way that language as having the grammatical features, which it does, which allows us, and I'm talking about us right here, humans, moderns today, who have the characteristics of the past tense where I can say I have been asleep and I can allow the the non-conscious experience that is my dreamless sleep to become part of who I am. It's not like there's just a gap where it seamlessly jumps from one consciousness and then right to the wide awake in the next... Uh, you know, after I wake up, it's not like it just jumps to it. I wake up remembering having been undifferentiated. See, this remembering having been undifferentiated or to the ability to actually recall the experience of the loss or the gap that we, again, cover over and we go, oh yeah, I fell asleep. We say, I fell asleep. We don't say, yes, earth recovered itself and now I'm illusory identifying myself with awakeness. Instead, again, we, we, we've built up this, this thing. Now, 
we've built up the illusion of the self-sufficing autonomous individual sort of floating through a world that it could exist independent of. Right? I mean, this is part of the problem. And, and I'm getting at this dreamless sleep issue because I think it circles back to the uniqueness of the brain and the problem of the sociality of thought and consciousness through language, right? It's that, you know, for Sartre, it's, there is a part of you that is for others, okay? So part of me flees from me, even though that is me. That is, part of me is not my direct conscious experience of me, and yet that is me, but it's something that flees from me. So, you know, you don't ever have a beautiful or ugly face if you were all alone in the world. Others have to deal with your face. You have to deal with their face. And that is a characteristic of you. you know, when I look at another, I see their face. That's a characteristic of them, but it flees from them. And so the boundaries between self and other need to be more amorphous. Even if each person is utterly unique in the sense that they have an utterly unique brain, there's another sense in which they're more commonly part, again, of an earth that is undifferentiated while the body is dreamlessly asleep and it emerges into a kind of awakeness. Now again, the, the, the brain itself is unique, but it's a unique constellation of socio-historical configurations. So its uniqueness isn't like it's unique and then something else is unique in a different way. It's that you're never unique in a non-social way. That is, that what is unique isn't ever set against the social. It's not like there's the unique individual and the social is over there. It's that the unique is the uniquely configured constellations of the individuals who are held and suspended within various kinds of relations with particular others in space and in time. I think what Sartre would say to that there is that you don't need this kind of eulogistic glossing. You don't need to say that it's a placebo effect and people are just going to, you know, take consolation in some hope for a future after they're dead or, or something like this. I think what you need to do is really stress to people that they are more connected to the earth and to others than they realize and that part of them flees from themselves. That what you do matters. What you do matters to other in, pra in practical ways right here in your everyday life. Uh, the things, the decisions that you make, they impact immediate others. They have long-term impact on uh, others who you've never met, sort of anonymous others. And what you do is always in some way a kind of role model for others. You know, I've, I've heard some people suggest that they don't want to be a role model. And this is sort of the cloak of, of anonymity that I've heard in response to my recent video. Some people said, no, well, you need anonymity. And how else will you express your view? And, you know, there are crackpots out there who will have at you if you really express your views. And I thought, wow, that's really unfortunate that so many people who maybe do have a lot to say and are interesting are going to so need the cloak of anonymity that they're never going to hold a public office. I mean, anyone who holds public office has to have the risks of being, I guess, in some way a target for people who disagree. But that's the price of trying to make real social change. I think that that really is a problem. But it, 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 it circles back. That is, one of the real effects that you have in being a person is that you are, whether you like it or not, some kind of role model for other people. And the the image that you, I guess, construct in the way that you live your life becomes, uh, for people, something to react against, to try to emulate. I mean, there's lots of different ways that people can respond to the way that one lives a life. But I think there is something more social in the world view, I guess, then is being recognized. And I'm not trying to be critical of Edelman. It's not like I think, oh, yeah, I'm going to tell him what's what. It's, it's nothing like that at all. I think if I would want to haggle, I would ask again about the question of the other in the scientific worldview. Will we be, ad will we be able to adequately understand the unique kind of sociality that makes for the conscious experience that we individually come to have um, and I guess to what extent can we, without, you know, we don't have to give some, some rosy, uh, 
I guess, belief in an afterlife because it makes people feel better. As much as I think that's, I'm sympathetic to that, and I think there are cases where, you know, certain people you just don't bring up the topic and you let it go. I think with other people, younger people, people who I think need the courage to realize the collective plight that we're all in and to stop postponing and waiting for some other place and other time, some divine source or something to bring about social and uh, social justice and I guess a, a more equitable world. I, I, I do think people need to realize that yes, we're, we're all dying, we're all dying together and when you're dead, you're dead, but you don't need to, again, placebo effect, what you need to realize is that you, the individual has been a hoax if it's been overly literalized. That is, you've always been places and moments of an earth which couldn't have itself except by, you know, only momentarily being able to release itself out of dreamless sleep into what we call ourselves and the world and all this kind of stuff. It's a periodic achievement. It's not the true self. Um, if anything, true self can only be found when we include dreamless sleep into awakeness and we recognize that having been undifferentiated is part of who all of us are. All of us equally share. I mean, when we're wide awake, I could say, well, you know, you're of this political party and I'm of that, or you're of this religious belief and I'm of none, or I'm of that religious belief, or all this kind of stuff. But in our having been dreamlessly asleep, all of us share a common ground of earth. And I think we're all likewise going to face that same end as we, you know, recess back to the earth at our death. But while we are awake, it's not that each person is an individual as much as that individuality has two dimensions. It has an individuality, which is, as Sartre would say, it's for oneself, it's the outward orientation, but there also is a for others. The way that uh, part of me is me, though it flees from me. And those, the way that it flees from me has a real important social impact on others. What one does matters, and it's important, even if one doesn't have life after death. Okay, um, I think maybe one last way to sort of round that out, and this would be to throw a, a shout out to Fred's video where he had one, I think called Being Human First, where he was talking as a response to, to be serious, and he was suggesting that you can't really be human first, and he was suggesting that, you know, we, we use sort of lower abstractions rather than these sort of higher order ones. And I was thinking about that and maybe a way to, to pick up some of that would be to say, imagine a person who says, yeah, I'm not, you know, a, a U.S. citizen. I'm a, I'm a human being before I'm of a nation state. Or they try to, they try to give that kind of argument. You could try to say that you're American, um, or you could try to say, no, I'm not really American. I'm, I'm human rather than American. But human is a word in English. And because it's a word in English, you don't really get to claim to be human before you're American because the very language that you're using from the perspective of others screams you're an American. And again, especially if the person doesn't speak the language. So there is, again, this problem of the other within the scientific worldview that I think is really going to need to be able to be accommodated for if we're ever going to understand the way the utter uniqueness of one's brain fits into the unique social historical configurations that each person is by being a nest of relations to other people. Okay. At any rate, I uh, hope that was useful for some people who also saw that Gerald Edelman video. To spread that video around. I, I do think he is a brilliant, brilliant man. I really enjoyed that video. Okay, thanks. I hope everyone's doing well. Have a good day.